But Carol, she does have some things she can boast about. Uh, the small <laughs> business success. She claims a record of 19 million small business applications were received under their leadership. And that's a record, I hear. That's what they say. <laughs> okay, so this is, I, I think most people know who listen to me on your program that I'm one of the world-leading experts on small business. Yeah. I've been entrenched for decades. Mm-hmm. I heard this, this, this thing, this small business applications, and I went around to every group that I know, and I said, what is a small business application? Because when I started my business, I didn't have to apply at the federal level. You know, certainly there, if I, I had an LLC, so I registered that with the state. Um, some people have sold proprietorships. What does this mean? Because we have 33 plus million small businesses, but, you know, that only grows on net you know, less than a million a year. So how is it possible that we have 19 million new application starts? And so far, no one's really been able to give me an answer. I have one one committee, um, you know, related to the uh, the House Small Business Committee who thinks that maybe there is some information that came from the state census data. But I asked them, they're actually having a committee uh, hearing, and I asked them if they could ask the SBA administrator and put her on the hot seat because they're running around touting these made up statistics to sound like there's some champion of small business. At the same time, Glenn, NFIB came out with their small business uh, optimism index today. The 32nd consecutive month that small business optimism has been below the historical average. And that's a 50 year average. Well, that's, because they fear Donald Trump is coming back <laughs> for 32 months. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is it's crazy because I see this number, you know, um, of 19 million small businesses. And I and I'm like, I thought that was just because of all the businesses that they had put out of business. They're like starting up new businesses. So I just thought they were taking credit, like they do with all the job creation. We've created more jobs. No, you (laughs) didn't. People went back to work. You had told them you cannot work. So, of course, there were people going back to work. But you're saying this isn't that at all. This is possibly even made up. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Something, but nobody knows really what, what it, it means. Is. It certainly is not a pro. It's not a proxy for new small businesses created, which is what they're intimating. And we know the number of small businesses. You know, a year ago was thirty-two point something million, and then it climbed to thirty-three point something million. You know, yes, that's on net. Unless they're killing eighteen million small businesses a year, uh, <laughs> which you know we know that they're they're certainly trying, but I Wait. don't think that they've succeeded in doing that yet. That this is a absolute, you know, it's it's just you know, spouting off nonsense, and they're doing this, you know, again and again to gaslight people into things are so great, we're so in your corner. But at the same time, she's coming out and she's tweeting about anti-small business policies, like the Pro Act that she said that she's going to put in place. Which, for people who don't know, that is the anti-gig worker and anti-independent contractor language from California's AB5 taken nationally. And they want to kill the gig economy and all the small businesses that depend on independent contractors in favor of unions and big business. So it's very difficult to say, I am the small business, I am the worker candidate, and still be in favor of these things, which is why I equate it to being like McDonald's being pro cows. You know, it, it is, as a small business owner myself, uh, I look at tomorrow uh, and think if, if they get in, the regulations, just the regulations alone that are still sitting out there that they want to impose, will just crush small businesses. These guys, you know, they used to say that, uh, well, the... Uh, uh, the Republicans are in with big business. Well, they were also in with small business, too. You know, they had a business attitude. These guys are only big business. They are only in with the giant global corporations. That's all they care about. And it is honestly like they are trying to impoverish 
the small business and impoverish uh, the middle class without moving any of the middle class up, they're moving them all down. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up regulation because, uh, as I mentioned, there's this House committee meeting right now. And they came out with a report earlier this year that the Biden-Harris agenda imposed $1.7 trillion in regulations on small businesses. And that was before we've had some of these pending regulations go into place. So I am certain that that's higher. And that is millions upon millions of hours that are wasted. That is real dollars that are wasted. And that's a barrier to success. You know, we keep hearing this ridiculous phrase, the opportunity economy. Well, if you want to create opportunity, you reduce barriers or you reduce regulation, you reduce taxes, you reduce the government being up in your business. And you have the government mind their own business so that you can go off and work in your business. You know, that I, is what it is all about. I, I, I know that our audience is heavy on entrepreneurs uh, and people who have done business for a long time. But there's also a younger generation that listens and explain why uh, regulations hurt opportunity. They hurt opportunity because, number one, they're costly. Two, you're spending time complying with the regulation instead of spending the time working and growing your business. And the challenge is that if you are a big company, if you're the Amazons of the world, if you're the Walmarts of the world, you have a whole, not only a whole balance sheet to deal with this, but you have a whole host of people in your, your company, whether it's HR or whether it's some other administrative function that can deal with these regulations. When it comes to small business, the majority, greater majority of small businesses, it's just the entrepreneur. So it's one person who's already wearing all of those hats trying to deal with this. Even if you have some employees, you don't have the wherewithal, the ability you're struggling enough to deal with inflation, finding the right workers, remaining competitive, dealing with cybersecurity and the like. You don't have time and you don't have bandwidth and you don't have capital to deal with these regulations. And some of them are so onerous that people want to close their business. Something that we've been talking about, Glenn, for months now, that the Corporate Transparency Act, which is this registration with the Financial Crimes Division of the Treasury. I've had hundreds upon hundreds of small business owners and people looking to start small businesses saying that they don't want to, they want to close their business, they don't want to start because they don't want to deal with the asymmetrical risk of having their information exposed or the government coming after them for doing something wrong. So because the government is imposing this regulation, which by the way is is still in flux, it's preventing these entrepreneurs from taking those risks and, and creating opportunity, which creates jobs, which creates more dollars in their community, which grows the economy, which is what we need to move ourselves forward. This is so obvious, but all they want to do is take away wealth, create barriers, redistribute it, and make it very, very challenging for a small business owner to succeed. You, um, I think it was you, Carol, said, Oh, maybe six months ago, we were talking and you said, uh, Glenn, most of the stuff that they've done doesn't really kick in until 2025. So we haven't felt the full impact of Bidenomics yet. Was that you that said that to me? Uh, pro- quite probably. Yeah, okay. Quite probably. So what yeah. is it that is coming still that that we haven't felt? What Describe next year just as it stands. Um without any new policies, if we just continued (laughs) where we are? Well, uh, as I said, the House Small Business Committee is doing a markup on seven different pieces of legislation trying to overturn um, all all of these stringent rules for small business. This Corporate Transparency Act, we have till the end of the year for that to go into effect. If, If there's no delay, which, by the way, there's two delay bills, and two repeal, bill, or two repeal bills and seven lawsuits. If we don't get that done by the end of the year, then people are going to be faced with compliance. And then on top of that, you know, we have the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, you know, 
large pieces of that is expiring and changing the way that small businesses have to look at their taxes and, and figure out um, you know, what makes sense for them from a, an administrative standpoint. So, you know, and, and that's, again, just <laughs> scratching the surface. So, you know, one after another, there are things in the pipeline. And then if Kamala Harris were to become president, Again, day one, they are going to try to rule by executive order. I mean, one of the other things, this um, Department of Labor rule, their uh, anti-independent contract rule, that went into effect in March. They haven't been truly enforcing it. I haven't seen much of the way of enforcement. But if they start to crack down on that, you know, that's something that could kill, you know, all of small business across across the board. Um, So there are just so many different things And it's challenging enough to own your own business, as you well know, as a small business owner, to not constantly have to to be worried about what's the next shoe that's going to drop coming from your own government. Um, Carol, one one last question. I'm going to take a one minute break and then I'd like you to come back and talk about they're talking about a 50 basis point uh, drop in uh, the, uh, you know, interest rate for loans. Um, Some people say. That's really good. Some people say that could collapse everything. Can, can you explain if that's a good thing or a bad thing at this point? Well, so I have always contended that the Fed didn't have the right tools to address inflation, that inflation was coming from supply constraints, not demand, that the Fed really uh, focuses on demand. And after 15 years of zero interest rate policy, that it wasn't really them that uh, that changed much of, of what was going on in, in terms of demand for new loans, et cetera. But they have taken up the interest rate very high. And a lot of people in the market, a lot of investors feel like they are behind the curve in terms of normalizing policy because they don't want to keep it so restrictive that they cause a recession. That, that's been the, the, the um, concern all along. So now that inflation has come down on a headline number, and we know cumulatively it's up over 20%, and that's what Americans are contending with. But from a policy standpoint, they see that inflation is coming down, and they see that the labor market mm, isn't quite as robust as they had hoped. And so they're trying to address policy to you know, quash any uh, rece- recessionary outcomes. That's really what they're trying to do. So they have a couple choices, right? They could do nothing as they have done for a while. We have about a minute. they could de- deliver a cut. And now they're deciding between a half a percent and a quarter of a percent. A half a percent may be bad news for them because it may give the market a signal that things are worse off than they are. So I think that they're going to be a little bit more cautious and go for that 25 basis point or quarter of a percent cut. Um, All right. So you don't think that it will, uh, unless it's 50 basis points, you don't think that it will uh, be a bad thing other than signaling that things might be worse than they thought. Right. And it's a much bigger signal at 50 than it is at 25, given where we stand with all the data. But I know you've got limited time. We could get more into that right. another day. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure that anybody will um, want to open up the purse strings at this point. I think everybody is waiting to see what's going to happen, you know, with the uh, with the presidential election. I mean, because we're going one way or the other and they're in opposite directions. So it's kind of a scary place to be as an investor or a small business person or just, you know, a regular worker in America today. Carol, thank you so much. Carol Roth.